So let, let's, let's begin. Let me read a passage of scripture and then I will pray and make some opening remarks and we'll turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Franklin. Uh, Proverbs chapter four, beginning at verse five says, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. That is Proverbs chapter four, verses five and six. Uh, let us pray. Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for this evening and this time to come together to share. We praise you for watching over us and allowing us to come together. We pray for our parents and grandparents and these children of our church and elsewhere who are doing this learning virtually and we ask and pray that you would bless our discussion and dialogue on tonight and that you would bless Dr. Franklin as she presents to us. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for, uh, for being present on Zoom tonight. I pray that everybody is well and that your families uh, are well. I said it in a sermon on, on Sunday a couple weeks ago. Um, I was here at home talking to Zachary and Jacob, and I told them um, that if we were going through a pandemic when they were in elementary and middle school, uh, I could not have handled it. It would have driven me crazy. Um, but at that time, uh, their mother was a teacher, and she's an educator. She could have done it. Um, but I know it would have driven me, would have driven me crazy. And so I know parents are trying to grasp this whole concept of virtual learning. Um, but we do have an expert tonight that's presenting to us because she is doing it in her school that she is a principal of, uh, Robert Gray Elementary School in Prince George's County. Uh, Sister Cheryl Franklin. Um, has a, a doctor degree in, in education and she has taught in Prince George's County as well as in DC public schools and I had her to send me a resume um, and if I would read it, it probably would take me the next hour to do so. She has um, made publications in, in various journals and has been interviewed in various educational journals as well. I always like to use what uh, my colleague, uh, Pastor Brody at Comedy Hills Baptist Church says about Dr. Franklin, uh, who partners with, uh, Comedy Hills Baptist Church partners with Robert Gray. And every time I see him, he just gives Dr. Franklin escalates, stating that she runs her school like a community college. She knows every student by by name, and he just rats and raves about her and her work uh, at her school. So I knew that she was doing this firsthand, and from what I've been hearing from my parents, uh, they are, as well as their children, are having some challenges adjusting. So I asked her to come tonight to give us. Um, some tips uh, that will help us along the way. And so I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you, Pastor Dalton. It is so good to see everybody. It's just so good to see people. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> it is just so good to see you all and to hear your voices. And certainly I pray that everyone is doing well as well as your families during this season. So I think we should go ahead and jump in. How do you feel about that? We can go ahead and get started. Yes. Fantastic. So I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see the chats, but maybe every few slides, I'll kind of stop sharing the screen to see if anyone has any questions or any comments in the chat that I can address. So here we go. So certainly we want to thank um, our pastor for um, having the vision of providing this resource to our families. This is very, very different. 
This is something that we did not expect, we did not anticipate, and yet here we are all becoming overnight experts in distance learning. And yet, even while we're doing it, we recognize that we have so much more learning and growing to do, not only on the part of the families and scholars that we service, but also as educators and professionals, we are learning and growing just as our parents are learning and growing as well. So thank you, um, Pastor Dalton, for providing this platform to our church family this evening. So first we want to say thank you. Certainly we say thank you to all of our first responders who are out there um, helping to keep everyone safe and well. But specifically on tonight, we want to thank all of the parents and guardians and students and educators. There are food service workers still making sure that our um, young people are having meals, to our custodians who still make sure that the facilities are being cleaned for our return, to social workers and people personnel workers who are going out to find children that haven't shown up in classes, um, to individuals who are in technology departments who continue to um, field our calls if something is not working right and certainly our community supporters who are doing their absolute best during this unexpected season of distance learning. So let's start off with just a quick question. So how are you feeling right now about distance learning? And you could probably pop this in the chat if you feel comfortable doing so. But are you A, are you person A, are you overwhelmed and you feel like you can't keep up? Are you person B? You're uncertain about how to handle it all, but we get some things done. Are you person C? I do my best to follow along and to get the work done. Or are you person D? You feel well equipped. So if you just want to um, shout that out, that would be great. If you want to pop it in the chat, that would be great as well. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a moment. How are you feeling? Overwhelmed, uncertain, you do your best or you feel well equipped? Let's talk about that for just a moment. How are you feeling? I see some responses in the chat. I see most people say they're person C. Anyone else? Okay, so let's see where we go from here. So I hear somebody, did someone take themselves off of mute? You wanted to share? Okay. If you are person A, B, or C, because I think even if you're person C, at some point you may have felt like person A. At some point you felt like person B, and simply because we've been doing this for a few weeks, we feel like we're doing our best to follow along and get the work done. So if you're A, B, or C, you are in the right place this evening. So what I want everyone to remember, and if you look at the picture in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, they are rubber bands. And I know when I have a staff meeting or, uh, you know, conversations with staff, and I know that it's going to be a conversation that's going to cause people to stretch themselves a bit, I come into the staff meeting with a bag of rubber bands and I pass out rubber bands to people because I want them to remember that whatever it is that I'm getting ready to talk about, I need you to take out your rubber band, I need you to stretch it because I need you to be flexible around what we're going to talk about today. So I extend the same to you that in this particular season, there are two words that I want you to really remember um, and, and lean into, and that is grace and flexibility. Give yourself some grace, give yourself some flexibility. Give your scholar some grace and give your scholar some flexibility. Give the school team some grace and some flexibility. And so I just simply uh, reiterate that students need this, parents need this and school teams need this. And so as I was looking for a, a scripture verse to align with this, um, I said, you know, I found 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 where it says, my grace is sufficient for you. So hopefully by us going through this and learning a little bit more, that you will give yourself a little grace and flexibility. So I want you all to take a moment to just take a breath Take a breath and we're gonna lean into grace and flexibility this evening. So we have a few goals today. 
We already did our check-in question, but these are the things that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some of the different devices. We're going to talk about different methods of instruction during distance learning, the various instructional platforms, some of the rules for distance learning, um, some sample schedules that you might um, apply when you're working with your young person at home. When should you contact the staff? We're also going to talk about some recreational opportunities for young people as well as some emotional support resources for our young people as well. So, on the left side of the screen, we've referenced a few of the devices that you or your grandchildren, your scholar may be using. So some of our scholars are using desktops, Chromebooks, laptops, iPads, or a tablet. Regardless of what it is you're using, you must be familiar with your device and how well it will access the platforms you will use for distance learning. So overnight, we had to become technology experts. Now, if you are like me, I recognize that the youth of today, we call them digital natives. It is who they are. It is what they were born into. They are very familiar with technology, but you and I might be considered digital immigrants. It is not what we were born into. It's what we've had to learn to be able to navigate in order to just be a part of society. So it is important that regardless of whatever type of device you're using, that you have to be familiar with that device and how it's going to access the platforms for distance learning. So I'm offering just a few troubleshooting tips. You should know how to contact the tech support assigned to your school and or district to gain support for your child accessing the platform successfully. So how can you do that? You can reach out to your teacher and or reach out to an administrator and let them know that you're having difficulty accessing some of the platforms and they should be able to help you troubleshoot or to put you in touch with someone that can provide you with some support. Now, one of the other things I wanted to share, this is really important because um, in my district specifically, um, we were asked to share this piece of information with our families, but I'm not certain that everyone really understands what this means. So some school districts now have monitoring software that will flag inappropriate searches where students are logged on using their school usernames and passwords. So every day I'm expected to go into a specific platform and click on um, a link which lets me see if there are any flagged searches. And so once we see those flagged searches, depending upon what's there, we have to address it appropriately. So if children are logged in using their, their school username and password, they are going to be flagged if they're looking at something that's deemed inappropriate. So we've seen some flags for YouTube videos. It may just be a music video, but depending upon the content in the music video, it will pop up as a flag. And so certainly if we see a flag that deals with some mental health um, topics, then we have to follow our district's protocol to make sure that we're communicating with the parent, the child, and the necessary agencies to support the young people. I'm going to pause there for just a moment. I don't know if anyone has any questions. If there's anything in the chat, I just want to take a moment to, to tip over. Sheena, yes, you, you, you have it. Sheena referenced the um, platform that's used in um, one specific Maryland district that helps us to monitor um, the activity of our young people online. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to go back to our presentation. Okay. So what are some of the big rocks um, you need to know? Now, not all districts are doing virtual distance learning as the only option. So your district might offer students the opportunity to complete packets. For some families, the option of technology just is not feasible, and so they prefer to do 
packets. If that's something that you and your family have opted to do, then you must know the frequency of distribution and the frequency of collection. So in some districts, the packets are printed and are made available every two weeks, um, and then they are collected. In other districts, the packets are distributed, let's say every two weeks, but they're not going to be collected until students return to the schoolhouse. So if that is an option for you, if packets are what you've chosen to do, please know the frequency of distribution and collection. Also, some districts are offering cable instruction in lieu of virtual learning and packets. So what does that mean? That means that um, your specific school district might have a local cable channel and on that cable channel they will have a schedule of instruction by school district employees but they are offering the instruction in a televised format. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that the virtual distance learning is not the only option that depending upon your school district, you might have the ability to use packets and or view cable instruction. So if you have opted to do the virtual learning, the distance learning, there usually are a couple of options. And one option would be pre-recorded lessons. So when the lessons are pre-recorded, there are many pros to this. It is convenient. You can replay the lesson as often as you like. You can pause the lesson. If the day is getting busy and you just need to stop the lesson, you can do so and come back to it when it's convenient. It is available when you are available. And so one of the things that we want to be very careful about in this season of distance learning is not assuming that all parents are at home with children. They are very, um, many parents who continue to work outside of the home because they're deemed as essential employees and or they are parents who are in the home but they are teleworking as well. So the pre-recorded lesson offers a convenient opportunity so that if the parent needs to address what he or she needs to address based upon their work schedule, they can access the lessons when it is convenient for them. You can also easily watch it usually from any device. One of the cons might be that you cannot ask questions during the broadcast and the student won't have an opportunity to interact with peers um, during pre-recorded lessons. And so in parentheses, I put their office hours because in that instance, you should uh, make yourself familiar with the teacher's office hours so that if you have questions, you can jot them down and then connect with the teacher at a later time. Um, for teachers that I am working with, some have opted to do pre-recorded, some have opted to do live lessons. If they're doing pre-recorded lessons, one of the things that I encourage them to do is to do a weekly check-in. So yes, we're doing a pre-recorded lesson. Students and parents can work at their own pace, but let's have a check-in so that if parents have questions, they can ask questions. If students have questions, they can ask questions. And the children still have an opportunity to see one another in a virtual platform. So we have to remember that even though the children are home and the academics is just one piece of what we're doing, they very much um, miss their friends. And so it is important, even if they're doing pre-recorded lessons, to try to provide an opportunity for the young people to see one another at least once a week. Okay. The next option would be live lessons. And so we know that our live lessons are those lessons that happen in real time. It requires that you're present when the lesson occurs. And so let me just pause right there for a moment. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I wanna see your faces when I say what I'm about to say. So when you have a live lesson, again, it requires that you are present when the lesson takes place. So this means as much as you may not want to admit it, you might become your child's personal assistant. Well, what does that mean? That means you have to know their schedule. You have to know what time that live lesson um, starts. You have to make sure that they are in front of that device because once the lesson is finished, it's finished. Once the lesson has started, it's started, and there is no rewinding to go back to something that the child may have missed. So that live lesson means that that child has to be present 
on time when the lessons take place. Also, another benefit of the live lesson is that you can ask questions of the instructor and you can interact with your peers in real time, in real time. So this has to be my favorite slide. And this slide um, references technology platforms. And as you can see, the page is sprinkled with various technology platforms. So believe it or not, our young people are accessing multiple platforms at any given time. And so as I was preparing for this lesson today, one of the things I thought about, I said, well, when did you begin to access uh, tech net technology platforms or distance learning? And I, I really think that I may have been in college. And so our young people, as young as kindergarten and pre-K, are being asked to access technology. But we have to remember, this is their world. This is who they are. And I have to say that more often than not, our young people are doing a phenomenal job accessing the technology platforms. So some of the platforms that um, might be familiar to you, certainly we know that our young people may be using Zoom or Google Meet to hold their live lessons, um, Clever, Dreambox, Canvas, MyOn, Microsoft Teams, Discovery Education, BrainPop, Kahoot, Blackboard, iReady, and there's so many more. So it is important that we know what it is they have to access and how best there to access it. So one of the things that we ran into very early on with distance learning is if students didn't know their username and password, then they were not going to be able to access the instruction. So making sure that your young person has their username and password, and in many instances, they also have to know their email addresses. So your district should have that information and should have provided that information to you. If you are sharing a device in the home or among siblings, because we don't want to assume that everybody in the home has their own personal device, especially if there are multiple children in the home. So if you are sharing a device in the home, the access to the platforms might be hindered if someone else is logged in to that device. So we have found that if another user is using it, they have to log all the way out and then your scholar can log in in order to access the technology platforms without any hiccups. Hmm. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, and these are just some simple distance learning rules. And so some of our teachers are using something similar to this, so they may have tweaked it a bit so that it fits their personality or fits what's happening in their um, online classrooms. But this is just something very simple that we want our young people to know when they are participating in distance learning. So I have the pleasure of sitting in um, virtual classrooms every day. And so, Sometimes you see children that are not following these rules. Sometimes you see the, the young people that have just gotten up and they might still be in bed. You might have children on that are not dressed appropriately for a virtual platform. And so we recognized very early that we needed to provide not only our young people with the rules, but to provide our families with the rules as well so that they knew what our expectations were for distance learning. So we want our young people to be prepared and on time. So that means if the session starts at nine o'clock, we want them to be there at nine o'clock. We want them to have their materials ready as well, um, that their camera would be on. And we are flexible with that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why we're flexible with that. Um, certainly at some point, you do want to see the children. You want to make sure that they're okay. But we also want to be sensitive to the fact that not every child is proud of their home life. And they may not want you to see um, an environment that they may be embarrassed about. And so you have to be very sensitive um, in demanding that a child would turn on their camera. Um, also, only turning on the microphone if you're going to respond to or ask a question. Generally, in a Zoom platform, the person that's the host has the option of muting everyone. 
um, and allowing students to unmute themselves only if they're going to respond or to ask a question. Um, we ask our young people to avoid and not be a distraction to others. And so sometimes students will have their device and they're walking around the house with their device. That is a distraction. Or if children are engaged in some activity that is not aligned to the instruction that's taking place, that's the distraction. Um, also use the chat only to pose relevant comments or questions. So we don't want to be in the chat box um, talking about a show that was on last night or a sporting event or whatever the case may be. So the teachers should have the option to either disable the chat or to allow the chat. It would be up to the person that's um, hosting the class. Also, because it is a classroom, we want our young people to use what? Appropriate language. It is a classroom. And um, this particular person said that students can wear their dress down Friday clothing to all sessions. So in my particular school, we're a uniform school. So we don't expect our young people to wear uniforms each day, but we do expect them to be dressed appropriately. Um, so one example would be we give our young people brain breaks. So after so many minutes of sitting in front of a device, we want them to get up and kind of move around. And in one particular session, the young person stood up and they were not completely dressed. And so these are things that A, we don't only want to communicate to the students, but we also have to communicate to our families. So this is a sample schedule. Um, it's really important that um, as parents and also as educators, but I'll start with the parents piece, that as parents that we know what content is going to be taught on which day. That's really important um, because it helps us to have the necessary conversations with our young people to say, okay, it's Monday, so you know you have math today. It's Tuesday, you know you have reading today. So that this, the child comes to the classroom, the virtual classroom, ready for that particular content and has his or her materials ready to support um, their learning for that day. As educators, it's important for us to make sure that we're communicating that very clearly to our young people and also to our families. So again, I think we've just finished week five or we're in week five of distance learning in my specific district. And so this is a good time to check in with parents to make sure that they are clear about what we need to do to continue the other half of distance learning to answer questions and to clear up any um, misconceptions that they may have. On the right hand side, it is just a sample schedule. Um, and as you see, this schedule goes from 8 a.m. until 3 o'clock p.m. But let me share this with you. So in many districts, they have said that students should not be involved in any more than let's say 90 minutes of instruction a day. They should not be involved in any more than 90 minutes of instruction a day. So that means them watching the pre-recorded lessons and or being involved in the live lessons, but that doesn't account for the remainder of their day. So I provided um, this particular schedule just as a sample, because we found that many people really were looking for ways to provide some structure to their young person's day. I did highlight three things there that are very important that perhaps we don't think about because the children are at home. But after they are engaged in that live Bro, lesson, what you doing? if they um, are engaged in the live lesson or if they are um, watching the instructional video, after that, give them a break. Give them a few minutes to just kind of get take a breath, to get a sip of water, to get up from the table, and then to come back and to complete the assignments and continue with their day. Another um, item that we may not think about is our young people should have 60 minutes of physical activity every day. And so we provided this to parents to just say, listen, allow them to do some movement at some point in the day. Also, put, your, put the baby's lunch break in there because they're going to be hungry around midday. So put a break in there for lunch and then give them time to transition back to work, finish up assignments and to engage in perhaps some enrichment activities as well. So again, this is not anything that's set in stone, but for those individuals that were just looking for um, a sample schedule, we provided it to them. So that is, this is another sample schedule. Um, if they have two subjects on Monday, you see that information there. And then again, what their schedule might look like for the remainder of the day. One particular district outlines it this way. 
in terms of just minutes, how many minutes per day they should spend doing a particular activity. So let's talk for a moment about when we should contact the staff. When should you contact the staff? Certainly it is your right to contact the staff at any time so that they can assist you with the virtual learning, distance learning process. But you want to make sure that you know the teacher or the staff member's office hours. All of the staff members um, have been told that they have specific office hours. And so you as parents, grandparents, guardians, you all should know their office hours so that if you email them outside of the office hours, you know that I may not get a response right now. Um, and so again, knowing their um, office hours is important. Also, are you familiar with the grading protocol that is in place for distance learning? So the grading protocol for distance learning um, is very different than the grading protocol during the normal school year. So at some point, someone should have communicated to you what the grading protocol is and why is that important. Just as on our jobs, we have evaluations. You want to know how you are going to be evaluated so that you can do the very best that you can. And it's the same thing for our young people, knowing that grading protocol. Um, if you're having trouble navigating the distance learning platform, you can't submit student work, you want to contact the staff right away. You want them to know that you are having difficulty um, submitting student work. You don't want anyone to think that you just haven't been turning in work because we just don't feel like it today. So you want to make sure that you communicate that. And then this is very important especially um, in my specific school, there may be families that do not have access to the internet in order to access distance learning, but they want to. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing information to families. You wanna be a resource. Academics is just one piece of what we do. We are also a resource to our school communities. So communicating to them to let them know that Comcast and Xfinity have provided um, cable, excuse me, internet services to families through, I believe, June 30th for free. So they can call these providers and they will provide them with internet um, services for free until the end of June. Also, some schools have been equipped with um, Wi-Fi, so if parents don't have the access at home, maybe they don't want to call Comcast or Xfinity for whatever reason, they can do what's called a drive up Wi-Fi. So selected schools do have this option where the parents can actually drive up to the school, sit in the parking lot, the students can get the work done. Um, that's a great option. And also I'm thinking about some of our older babies, some of our babies who may be in high school who have to work to help the families. So perhaps in their transitioning to work or coming back home from work, maybe they can pull into the school parking lot and try to get some work done. Also many of the libraries um, also have Wi-Fi that can be accessed from the parking lot. Also, some districts have provided hotspots. So if you don't want to do Comcast, you don't want to do Xfinity, you can get a, a small device that you can carry with you in your purse. You can have it with you at home. You turn it on and it will allow you to access the internet wherever you are. So we don't want to forget that our young people are exactly that. Our young people are young people. And so we don't want to take away from them these things that, that um, in essence, help them to enjoy their youth. And so I'm sharing this with you because there's so many activities out there um, that are available for our young people while they are at home. And so I know every Monday, um, former First Lady Michelle Obama, she does a reading um, of a particular book and it's posted on YouTube. LeVar Burton, for a period of time, was reading books to children and you can go on YouTube and find some old Reading Rainbow videos. Dolly Parton is also doing read alouds. I think she calls hers bedtime um, bedtime stories or bedtime with Dolly Parton and she reads stories to children. Um, there are so many videos that have these workouts for children. Again, getting in that physical activity. I know my PE teacher, um, Monday through Thursday, 
does a Zoom fitness session. So for 30 minutes every evening from 6 to 6.30, he's on there and the families can join on and they can engage in some sort of physical activity. Also, through the Kennedy Center, um, this particular artist, Mo Williams, has um, an art lesson that's available on um, their website, and I believe it may also be available on YouTube as well. And then Debbie Allen, who knew? Debbie Allen is doing free Instagram live dance classes every week. And I believe Saturday morning, she does an early bird session for the little children. And it's so much fun. And again, it is for free. You don't have to pay for any of these resources. One other thing I want to spend a few moments talking about is just emotional support for children. So, you know, as adults with everything that is going on right now with COVID-19, sometimes we have moments where we're trying to just grapple with all of what's going on, but children also are trying to grapple with what's going on, not being able to go to school every day, having their normal routines interrupted, not being able to see their friends or having play dates the way they used to, um, or if they've seen some things on the news or heard family members talk about what's going on, they may need emotional support. And so I wanted to provide you all with some of the resources that I came across. Um, you can check out their websites. There's some excellent, excellent resources there for talking with your children during this time, for helping to explain um, the whole notion of COVID-19. And so simply asking children one, one very pointed question, how are you feeling? And then allowing them the opportunity to really talk to you and let you know how they're feeling about all of what's going on right now. And so I'm wondering if anyone has any questions, any questions for me, I'll stop sharing my screen. Does anyone have any questions? Uh oh, Miss Smith, I think you're you're muted. You're on mute, Sister. Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Franklin? I sure can. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's an excellent presentation, and Great. one of the reasons I'm on it because I wanted to see what I could share with Brittany, a oh, parent yes. with two children. Yes. So, will one of you answer? Will slides be available? or will there be a tape to share? I've been informed that the recording will be made available. Pastor Dalton, did you wanna? Yes, it will it'll be made to, available to the congregation. Great. Okay, and to non-MMBC members, could access it then too? Dr. Frank? That's fine, that's fine. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Certainly, absolutely, absolutely. I've got to go to another Zoom, so I want to get the rest of it. All right. I know we're all Zooming these days, right? <laughs> and 7.30. Yes, yes. Enjoy. Thank you for hanging in there with us this evening. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your support. Okay. I'm gone. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Does Anyone else have any questions or maybe any aha moments? Was there anything you, you know, you may have said, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Or we still have a few more weeks to go and maybe I'm going to try this. I hadn't tried that. Anyone? You can type think, it in the chat. I think there was a question in the chat. Dr. Let's Franklin. see. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, I love that one. Sheena, I love it. So the question is, what are your suggestions for educators who are trying to balance teaching virtually and children at home? And so I'm going to assume based upon one of your um, earlier answers that you are in a specific district that I'm familiar with. And so one of the things that we um, have noted is that the hours have been reduced. Um, and in conversation with colleagues, that was also out of consideration for individuals who are at home also with what children. But what I have found is that I am on the computer until from about eight o'clock in the morning, maybe seven, seven, eight o'clock in the morning until sometimes seven, eight o'clock at night because now everything is virtual. 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm on. And so I have to be very conscious of when to say, okay, let me step away and come back to it the next day. And so I think when you think about the scheduling, knowing what educators have to do during the day, how do we do that and then balance our young people? So perhaps for you, maybe an option might be to do a pre-recorded lesson if your role is a classroom teacher, because then you can record those lessons, you can have those lessons pushed out to your babies, but then during the day, you can spend time making sure that your baby gets what they need and then really carving out the office hours that are convenient for you so that you know what the best time of day is for you to be able to reach out and talk to your young people. I hope that was helpful. If not, maybe we can talk offline and I can share a bit more. Thank you for the question though. You're welcome, Gemini. Anybody else, any other questions, any ahas? I know Ms. Trout said she may have to do this in the fall. I don't know if she has any questions. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have any questions, but I always like to keep up with what's going on and how it's going because you never know what you ha might have to do. That's true. I might have to do my babies. I might have to school my babies if they got to go back to work. Absolutely. 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 And at any time, if you all need any help, okay, there is a question. What advice can you share with keeping your high school senior focused on classes when there is not a set schedule provided as when in school? I love that question. So to the parent who has a senior in high school, first of all, let me say bless you because God bless you because this has just been a very different year. So we all remember our senior year in high school and all the wonderful things that we would have been doing at this time of year, um, that there would have been prom season and, and all the other things that are coming out in terms of like graduation. And so one of the things that I had to have a conversation with a high schooler that I'm very familiar with, Miss Brenda, and we had to sit down and look at a schedule. So the good thing is the emails that go to, to him also come to me. I'm thankful for that because then I can kind of keep track uh, uh, in terms of what's, what's what. And so I know that every Monday, this is due. Every Tuesday, this is due. Or these quizzes are coming up and in this. So it's like, okay, hey, look, you know how to do a schedule. I want, and, and you go ahead and do it and let me take a look at it. And so, as I said early in the presentation, as much as we may not want to um, admit it, we do in a sense become personal assistants. But I, I think when you release yourself to just making sure they know the when, the where of, of, of how to move forward with the distance learning, then they do a better job being independent learners. I hope that was helpful, Ms. Brenda. I was just going to share, too, for older students, I think the executive functioning skills really, uh, you can really see where they struggle mm -hmm. um, when they don't have someone there to guide them. So I think it's really important to help them, like you said, create that schedule. And those, I am, I'm in middle school, so they're going to be transitioning to high school next year, and they might start from you know, they might start their freshman year from home. And yeah. so this is the time I feel like that we have to really guide them through how do you plan this for yourself? Not, mm -hmm. not going to be spoon fed this anymore. And mm -hmm. so I think that's where I see. And once they get it, once they get, oh, I'll do this, do that, then they can kind of excel. Um, and I was just going to say one more thing that sure. um, the social emotional peace is really big um like you were saying the kids just want to see each other so yes. having those zoom calls um and some of them are just for fun and we did one today um and we just got all the science teachers together and did kahoot on zoom yes yes um, so much fun. fun but i think that's so important they they don't necessarily you know to be so connected they don't necessarily know how to connect with each other yeah but giving them those opportunities to see each other and have a conversation are really important i love that you talked about um the the older children and the scheduling is so important the scheduling is so important so you can't stay up all night you have to be up and you have to be up the next day. You have to get this done and really developing the schedule or let me see what this schedule looks like. I, you need to do it. And I see that someone um, popped into the chat for the senior. This is a college preview. 
And it is, it is. This is exactly what they're going to be expected to do because they really are being thrust into being independent learners and utilizing that technology to help them navigate. And so it's interesting, as I was telling my teachers, I said, you know, you all have office hours just like professors have office hours. And the children have to be able to advocate for their own learning and to dip into those office hours and to advocate for themselves so that they can get what they need. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment, Sister Bell, Sister Trustee Bell. Anyone else? We don't want to leave anyone out. If you all have any other questions or comments or ahas. Okay, thank you. All right, so there is a question. Any executive fun functioning skill building tips or resources? Was that question for Miss um, Monica? Um, I mean, I can give an answer and then you can give a better answer. No, we, um, we can, we, this is a, a, a <laughs> collaboration. Um, for honestly, just uh, recognizing if a student is struggling, um, we made some a couple different tweaks in our own um, system at our school to give more guidance to a parent as to what the pacing should be. Um, because we kind of do a Monday download of a week's worth of assignments and then they mm -hmm. have to figure out when it's more self-paced. Um, so one, tuning in with the student to see, are you struggling? Does it make sense? I just I also point out to them to start to, um, they have to be self-reflective. Mm -hmm. What do they like to do? What do they not like to do? Mm -hmm. are they putting things off till the end. Um, you know, are they waiting until the last minute to turn things in and, and trying to point it out to them that that's maybe where the struggle is. Um, but I feel like executive functioning skills are one of those low lying, like, again, you were saying they're very tech savvy but they're also tech savvy with what they want to do. Mm -hmm. If you want to download a video or, you know, it be on Instagram, it's a little bit harder when they're expected to create a paper or a product. Um, they might not have all those skills. So recognizing that as well and helping them through, you know, how does Google Docs work and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. And I, I love that you said that, you know, the educator really has to be a resource. So even after you, th you, you think that you have um, given the information, understand that you're going to give it again, and you may have to give it again, and then you may have to avail yourself to going online and saying, hey, let me just do another session. Let me show you what this looks like. Let me actually show you how to navigate. And so I know my team came up with videos, not always for the children, but also for the parents. How do you get into Google Classroom? How do you access Clever? How do you do this? Parents, no parent wants their child to be unsuccessful. And so we found that while we were providing the information to the young people, we also had to provide that same information and guidance to parents as well. But those check-ins are so important. I have a grade level that does the pre-recorded lessons and they are wonderful, but their office hours are from nine to one. So Monday through Friday, they are available online. I can pop in at any time between nine and one. And they are available for any student who wants to pop in to those sessions. And if I'm on there with them, students will be popping in all day because they just want clarification around something. They, they want to go over something. They want to read the essay to the teacher. They want to share their screen. And so I am amazed at just what they have been able to do in this period of time. But I think as, as um, Sheena shared and as you shared, Monica, that um, the executive functioning skills, sometimes they're not aware of what they don't know and we as educators, again, those two words that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, have to be able to ex exercise some grace and also flexibility and give them what they need. Okay. Well, Pastor Dalton, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to collaborate and to learn from each other and hopefully to help um, someone else just continue to have a successful remainder to the school year. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Franklin. And I want to thank everybody for being on the Zoom meeting tonight. We will send out the link um, tomorrow and you can share it with those who you would like to share it with. Uh, I'm praying for 
you and your your students, praying for the educators that are not only on the Zoom call, but uh, educators all across the country. And I'm praying uh, that our children will continue to learn during this time. So I'm going to pray and you all take care of yourselves and we hope to see you real soon. Let us pray, Father, we thank you and we praise you for uh, this day's journey and we praise you for this opportunity to listen and to learn. We ask and pray that you would bless our children, bless the parents, and bless the educators as we uh, seek to learn more. And we ask and pray that you would bless us in the process. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Good night. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.